Good afternoon, everyone. I cordially welcome you all for the sixth lecture of the short course on cultural linkages towards an Asian ideology. Today, we are focusing on Asian identity towards peace and harmony. The agenda for today is such that the lecture is scheduled to be for 45 minutes with a short break of five minutes followed by a question and answer session. Ladies and gentlemen, may I now have the honor of introducing our guest lecturer, Mr. S. Satish Mohan, Senior Lecturer of the Department of Strategic Studies of the Faculty of Defense and Strategic Studies at General Sir John Patalavala Defense University. Our esteemed guest holds the MA in Conflict Resolution from the University of Bradford in the United Kingdom, a MA in International Peace Studies from the United Nations University for Peace in Costa Rica, and a BA Honours in Philosophy with a first class from University of Peradeniya in Sri Lanka. Mr. Satish Mohan is a senior academic in his field of expertise with many years of experience teaching at university level. His interests lie in the fields of peace and conflict studies, international politics and security studies, United Nations and peace operations, human security in South Asia, and gender in post-conflict Sri Lanka. Mr. Satish Mohan is also the proud recipient of many prestigious fellowships. Some of them include Commonwealth Scholarship to the United Kingdom, International Visitors Leadership Fellowship to the United States, Emerging International Leaders Fellowship to the United Kingdom, and Asia Leaders Fellowship to Japan. Sir, we are profoundly honored to have you here with us today, and we warmly welcome you to deliver this lecture. Thank you. Hi, uh, Samaratunga, thanks for the wonderful introduction of myself. So I just recall. So I'm audible. Yes, sir, you are. Okay, brilliant. Tyranny, thanks. So let me share the presentation. Right, here we go. So, so we got about uh, 65 participants, including me. So then uh, it's, the way it's good. Uh, let's see. Okay, we are right on time. Uh, so according to the agenda, so we'll continue the lectures till uh, 3.45 and then five minutes break. And then uh, until 4.20, I will continue the second space of the lecture. And then from 20, sorry, 4.20 to 4.30. So the 10 minutes I offer, uh, we could have like kind of a very fruitful uh, Q&A &A session. So that's the agenda. So. Uh, I'm profoundly delighted in the sense like um, delivering a lecture in this kind, uh, which I believe it's, it's more like uh, inclusive that the faculty that the KDU has, and also uh, it's good to know the folks that are not even teaching with them, some of the faculties. So in that regard, so I'm quite humble and this team is in, in that sense, uh, thanks to Dr. Heyman the, who identified me in a way to have one of the potential candidates for delivering this lecture. So anyway, so it's quite interesting in the way that uh, what we discuss about uh, this, this particular topic, something on Asian identity towards peace and harmony. Uh, in a way, of course, I do understand uh, the series of lecture that you have been following, something profoundly on Asia, and of course, from a various point of view, uh, which I believe, I think, the very first day that when I was there for the inaugural session, so you had lectures, something on economic aspects. So likewise, uh, you have been following some of the uh, aspect that related to Asia in the wider spectrum. So when, uh, with that line of thinking, uh, today's uh, session also is something not strange to you in a way that uh, what this uh, topic is precisely looking for is something 
Asian identities towards peace and harmony. So since I'm I'm coming from a kind of the peace uh, peace background, uh, the peace scholar rather, and also attached to the faculty where we discuss more or less on our international relations and strategic studies. So I do focus about uh, today's presentations also in line with uh, my area of expert, something peace and harmony, and also kind of the geopolitical and the kind of the geo strategic and also the geoeconomic aspect, uh, particularly to Asia, right? So that is something I'm limited uh, to focus those narratives into the given uh, contextual factors. That is something Asia. So Asia, of course, uh, it may look like um, uh, uh, in a way that um, uh, quite significant in terms of uh, the diversity that Asia has. And also, even, even in the Asia, there are so sub uh, regional and uh, extra regional and, and so many concerns that we could look into what we are actually talking about uh, the peace and harmony in relation to the so called Asian identity that is something from north to south to east to west. So, that is something very, very, very much interesting. And also, I just want to give you a kind of scenario before we move on to a specific topic under which uh, Asia in a way that you all know in a way that that uh, consists the per surface of uh, nine percentage of the surface of the total uh, globe uh, out of which uh, not out of which and also like around 30 percent of the land mass right so that is something very interesting and the most striking part is, so we, we, we know that the global population is like 7.5 billion, out of which uh, Asia alone has uh, roughly pretty much uh, 4.5 billion uh, population. So that is something more than 60% of the global population somehow living in this uh, uh, highly conduct and multi-oriented uh, and multi-complex uh, the Asian region. So that is something uh, more than 60% of the global populations and, and more than 30% uh, of the global land mass and also 90% uh, of the global surface. So that is something uh, fascinating about Asia. So then uh, we, we have to go into very, very specific and narrow perspective in order to uh, in order you to make uh, some sort of understand within the given time less than pretty much an hour, an hour right? So that is something uh, quite interesting for me and also uh, for us. So a quick look what we are going to discuss under, under the given topics. So first and foremost, I will be explaining so what is actually this Asian identity or Asian centric that we are supposed to uh, look at wider and the specific context and also the topic given to peace and harmony uh, what, what makes uh, Asia uh, in line of thinking peace and harmony so under which so we got some exciting exciting stuff into culture festival food uh, religion and, and other dimension into ethnicities and, and so many ways and things like that and then uh, of course when it comes to Asia, and since I'm also from the IR and the strategic studies point of view, so we will look about uh, who are the major players or the major power in Asia. Uh, and also, uh, we will look very specifically uh, with the nature of the Asia in line of thinking to the geopolitics and the geostrategic and the geoeconomics uh, in, in a brief context. And also, uh, kind of a concluding remarks, I uh, we would uh, see so what sort of uh, area we could uh, the get the maximum out of this the topic that uh, peace and harmony in Asia. So in that line of thinking, so I would uh, kind of uh, correlate into the dispute or the violence and peace and harmony, and what the realistic perspective, right? Rather be so ideal. Of course, the topic may look like the Asia and towards peace and harmony, of course, it, in a way that uh, we could uh, see a lot of good thing out of that, but 
but also we see uh, kind of uh, the dispute or the conflict uh, among uh, among the member states in in the Asia the wider context and also the sub region. But uh, more pro more importantly, we will look uh, kind of the area that connected to peace and harmony, right? So that is something uh, we are looking at. So when we think about some sort of identifications, the first and foremost, the, the geography comes to the scene. So of course, I got some uh, specific term that geopolitics, geoeconomic and geostrategy, but in a way that uh, uh, to, to, to look at Asia broader, from the broader perspective, of course, you could see the map. So as you saw, this map it, it's, it, 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 it's more than 30% of the global uh, land mass, and again, 9% of, of, of the total global uh, surface, and more than 60% of the uh, global population absolutely live. So, of course, this may look like kind of a, a kind of a, a weird, uh, uh, in a way, weird uh, picture. Of course, even uh, some of us, we also from Asia. So when we think about a kind of East Asia or the West, pretty much the West Asia and the Central Asia. So those are not really uh, under the consideration of what we, we, we think about Asia. So when it comes to Asia, we always think in East Asia or uh, so Southeast Asia and also South Asia. And pretty much in some point the Central Asia, but uh, the, the West Asia is pretty much discussed under the concern of the Middle East, right? But in fact, uh, that also part of the, uh, the Asian uh, understanding. So as we see, so there are like um, 48 uh, legitimate states that have been uh, recognized by the UN, right? The United Nations uh, that uh, the part of the Asian territories or Asian countries in that regard, so almost most of the Middle Eastern also uh, being occupied under the spectrum or under the umbrella of the geographical location into Asia, right? So that is something quite interesting for us as well. And also a kind of a, some borderlines for the Turkey, for instance, the Turkey and some of the uh, the Central Asian countries like Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia, uh, and also Russia in that point, uh, also consider uh, like the Asia, but even though it's in a way Russia considered like the Eurasia or the rest of the part like the Middle East in that concern. But anyway, so something that you have to be very precise when we look about Asia, there are 48 legitimate states and some of the uh, states like the Taiwan or the Congo and Mako. So those are uh, kind of recognized uh, in a sense like uh, the territory, not really uh, uh, the nation states uh, from the perspective of UN. So in that regard, uh, there are 48 legitimate states and three uh, kind of consider uh, territories. And if you want to think that Russia also part of that, then it can be uh, for 51, or 52 uh, in total, right? So that is something. Uh, so now why I'm just showing you the, the, the world map, at least uh, to give you a kind of a, a holistic understanding about the complexity of the Asian identity, right? So it's something from east to west, north to south. Anyway, so if you look about, as we look uh, about the, the East Asia, uh, this is the most uh, important and kind of the develop uh, uh, the, the region uh, that part of the Asia, right? The China is the number two in world economy. And then uh, there are five countries that uh, Japan and Korea and uh, China, right? So those are the kind of develop or maybe except China and Mongolia, the uh, Korea and the Ch Japan is considered as part of the developed and the global North, not really the global South. But again, China, even though it become like a number two in terms of economic term, more than uh, GDP, more than uh, 14 trillion USD per annual, but still consider the developing country for, 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 for various reasons. So that's not the point that we want to look into. So there are five, five countries that can be considered the East Asia. 
So I likewise, there are 11 countries uh, can be considered in the Southeast Asia, right? So that is something uh, quite interesting in a way that uh, why the sub-region and, and the famous one, the, the ASEAN is this part of the, the Southeast coalition. And then uh, we got uh, the typical South Asia, which again has a uh, pretty much, I mean, in a way, sometime people say, okay, some of them, but Iran and Afghanistan, but we don't really see, the, I mean, in some point people think, okay, Afghanistan also is part of the South Asia, but Iran also can be considered. So in that regard, there are nine countries uh, uh, in um, South Asian periphery, right? So that is something for your uh, level of understanding. And then the, the Central Asia, again, there are five uh, countries. So that is something uh, I think presently very much uh, notable talk about Central Asia uh, since the, the issues with Afghanistan and, and connected to Central Asia and Euro, Euro, Euro Asia or the Europe in that regard. And then, um, yeah, the West, I mean, it's not really understood as part of the uh, Asian subcontinent or the Asian periphery, but at least it's considered even though it is the Middle East, but it's even in, in other term, the Western um, Asia. So there are again, um, 11 countries, uh, sorry, again, uh, 18 countries, that is the massive, that, that, that as I said, is part of the Central Asia, uh, some of the periphery, some, some of the, uh, the buffer, so buffer countries like Armenia, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Turkey and all, Cyprus. Uh, still consider, but also the Israeli Palestinian consider, <laughs> and again, the typical uh, Middle Eastern. So now I think uh, you are a bit of clear what we really divide into uh, kind of the Eastern, Southeast, and South and Central and the West Asia. So in that regard, there are a kind of 48 legitimate states, plus two or three uh, kind of uh, consider territories. Right, so that is something uh, geo 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 geographical mass. So then, as as you see, uh, I, I even said about. So the one way to identify uh, the continent Asia, the geography, uh, it's concerned. So then, of course, when we think about the Asia as a whole, from from uh, what you call the East Asia, the Southeast Asia, more, most are the most are the, I mean, those are the more powerful states in terms of economy and then South Asia and then the Middle East or the West Asia and also the Central Asia to a significant extent. So with that regard, you might think how the, I mean, the identity would be complex in terms of uh, multi-dimensional aspect into race, religion, ethnicity, economy and geography and the culture and norms and things like this. Eh? So that is something uh, really, we are looking what the complexity and also kind of the peace and harmony that, that's given the topic. So as you all know, there are 48 and three territories, that's according to UN. And uh, again, South Asia, more than 60% of the global population is, is 4.6. And then, and also more than uh, 2,300 language being spoken uh, in, in uh, Asia. So that is quite understandable. But the majority, you would say the Chinese, because it's more than 1.4 billion are Chinese, Chinese and Hindi, again, India, 1.38 .3, billion uh, populations, and Bangala, Beng, uh, Bengalis, and the, and the Arabs, even as part of the Middle East and Central Asia, part of it. Uh, those are the mainstream language uh, widely spoken. But uh, you can imagine, uh, more than 2,300 2, language based on the tribes and, and, and divisions, uh, class, and so, so many aspects uh, you would think about. And of course, the English is again uh, uh, the major spoken language that thanks to the Euro or the influence by the Euro uh, Asia. Right. And also, kind of a, but not exactly like more than 10 trillion because there are anonymous uh, religious beliefs and all that South Asia, but the mainstream religion, uh, sorry, in Asia, the mainstream religion in a way, uh, 
like the Hinduism, the Buddhism, Judo, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and Sikhs, and uh, those are the, the main uh, mainstream and uh, Confucian from uh, this part of Buddhist philosophy, but still the East Asian religion is also again quite uh, diverse and, and complex in that regard. And ethnicity, that is something very interesting from the Britannica. So even though we have the kind of a, a historical sense that something from major ethnic line, the Indo-European and Indo-Aryan, Dravidas and Mongolian, and all it's, it's connected. So in a way, Asia, you see, uh, it's quite, quite diverse in terms of ethnic division and the tribes and the race. Uh, that also kind of interlink with the language and, and the, the region and the, the migrations and the culture and the norms and the religion. Uh, that is something uh, quite understandable, right? So there are uncountable uh, ethnic, ethnic uh, identification and the race uh, exercise, but uh, we don't necessarily to think into the more into complex, but at least uh, you should really think about at least this to this, uh, the language and religious and ethnic uh, line of understanding, something from uh, a kind of sub-regional division, right? The, the East Asia is pretty much uh, the Chinese and Korean and the Japan and Mongolian in that regard. So the language uh, race also connect to that nature. And in South Asia, it's, it's, it's again Hindu, um, Islam uh, and the Buddhism and other others, other forms of Christianity and Sikhs and Judaism is for uh, Jain, Jain, and all these things. And again, Central Asia is part of the Christianity and Islam. And then the Middle East or the West is pretty much again uh, the Islam and Christianity and Judaism. Is and then, then Southeast, that Asian, it, it, it's like a mix, right? Hindi, Chinese, uh, Malaya, all or local dialects and, and, and the religious and the language, right? So that is something quite interesting. Even you, yourself could uh, differentiate uh, this diversity even based on uh, uh, the sub-regional context, right? So, 45 minutes. So, okay, this is something uh, very fascinating to me. As we see, when we think about the identity or the Asian identity, one is, is, is the geography. So that is something I spent the, the last 10 minutes uh, something to explain what's this geographical and sub, sub -perif periphery and sub regional context. That's something uh, kind of trying to forecast the uh, unique character of the people who belong to the language, culture, religion, identity, norms. And that's how we see, even though it's Asia, the East Asia is quite different from South Asia and the Central Asia or the Middle East. Right? Or, or the South Asia is different from Southeast Asia to the Middle East or the West Asia. So that is how you differentiate uh, the patterns and the periphery. That is something uh, we could think uh, from the Asian point of view. Right, so this is, these are the major religions. So the Confucian, that is something the East Asian class, especially the Korea, China, and the Japan, that's something kind of, a, a, Kind of the philosophical understanding of religion so that Buddhism and Confucian was were predominant and the dominant character into that, and then the South Asia until even up to even some point uh, East Asia the, the Hinduism and the Buddhism uh, are more, more more prominent and also Sikhs and Jainis and again Judaism and the Jerusalem, the Christianity also is part of this, and the, the Muslim that people go to Makkah, the Islamic world. So in that sense of the Asian identity from the religion, it's multiple. It's not really only from the Eastern religion, that is something Confucian, Buddhism, Hinduism, and, and, Buddha, and the Western, like Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. So, so it's kind of the mixture. But these are kind of legitimate religion, more than 10, but indirectly or directly, there are uh, hundreds of religion that people believe, right? <laughs> so that is the sub branch, branch, and also uh, people from no really religious background. So that also they are in Asia, right? So that is something very interesting. So, and the other uh, uh, 
concern or other item to discuss uh, the identity, it's absolutely a culture. So again, I would say there are quite similarity. So that is why we are distinguished like Asian. So Asian is distinguished from the West, that is the Asian. So even though we see from the subcontinental division from East Asia, South Asia, or Central or South, South Asia, or Southeast and, and the Middle East in that point, but you could see the similarity or in, in, in diversity. So the culture anyway, that reflect uh, uh, the geographical uh, uniqueness and also uh, the people and the custom and norms that uh, occupied heavily to a particular context or the, from the particular cultural point of view. So you could see uh, the India brothers and the Japanese uh, and, and the, the Indians again, Katagas and Sri Lankans and the Thais and the Central Asians and, and the Middle Eastern, so, so all of course. So the, the, I mean, you could simply understand when the Asia, even though for, for the geographical perspective that we divide or kind of separate from the rest of the world, but in a way, uh, so each pattern is connected because of the migration and, and a lot of civilization were, were taking place in Asia, a great periphery that go up to uh, the Middle East and even the uh, Central Asia and above. So this is something uh, I just want to give you. Of course, you can get thousands of cultural uh, differences uh, among 60% of the global populations highly located in, in Asia. But these are few of them are kind of a uh, significant uh, icon that uh, I thought to you know share with you. And the other item, of course, the food. So so that also same like uh, the culture, the food also reflects the the uniqueness of the culture and people belong, right? So uh, Asia in a way uh, seems famous for cuisines that Indian, Chinese, Thai, Japanese. Sri Lankan, so we got like a very unique and also very uh, kind of a interlink uh, uh, food uh, habits and culture. So, so that is that, that's the bottom line that I just want to give you again uh, the food and even uh, some of the food you may think like a uh, food culture that uh, kind of weird or the people may I mean that is something even the origin of the uh, the COVID also been discussed in the wild. Uh, the markets or the, or the people you know get from insects to all kind of all sort of you know uh, living creatures that they they, they take into a dish so that is something we could see the diverse of asia uh, you know the people i mean the food culture that's something from legitimate and kind of unlegitimate patterns of food but anyway food is food but that's really distinguished each cultural perspective and beliefs and, and proud. So this is something uh, you, we had to share. <laughs> right. So the other item is something that the festival. So again, um, uh, uh, the same line, same line of thinking, how this individual, I mean, each uh, festival uh, become, becomes important in a way to reflect the cultural, the religious, and the geographical, and also ethnic uh, background uh, of, of the people and of the region, of the, of the nation states, of the province, of the district, and, and, and even uh, the state wise, right? India, if you think India, there are many states that each state can determine with their unique festival uh, outlet. So, likewise, even you could see uh, some of the uh, kind of a famous uh, you know, festivals that celebrated uh, around uh, Asia. So when you think about the Chinese festival or Chinese New Year, and then the Buddhist Jayanti, and then the Holy festivals and Japanese uh, festival. And again, India is, is more diverse. So there are a lot of stuff and Sri Lanka and, 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 and the Southeast Asia and the Middle East. Uh, you could see how this festival is not something that uh, they may look like different from each other. So of course, they are very unique. I mean, each is unique in terms of uh, back background. That's something profoundly linked to cultural language, really, and ethnicity, and all this uh, background. But at the same time, 
uh, this is how kind of a kind of uh, displaying what's the, what's the what's the nature and what's the practice of the country how so i mean even though people are divided in terms of celebrating their their festivals but uh, in a way they are united uh, as a country and as a region or as a country as a sub region as a uh, uh, region so let's say i mean as a country even in south asia each country has this kind of a unique uh, festival outlook but when it comes to south asia so pretty much the, most of the uh, you know festivals somehow related right so and most of, and also the festival connected to the religious belief and and in, uh, the, the religious background in that regard but there's some at the same time east asia or southeast asia it, it is somehow related to chinese character or the japanese character or, or, or even the religious concern that buddhist come to play a huge role and then the uh, the festival that uh, trying to win the himona festival that japan is uh, highly celebrated those are unique to japan and also kind of the world and the asian icon so what you have to really understand from the, the diversity of the festival in a way each festival may look like uh, the different coming from various background but at the same time uh, in a way they they are united uh, uh, from the regional sub region and also that unite people uh, regardless uh, you know their individual differences caste class ethnicity or even regional boundaries right or the language so that is something we are talking about the harmony and the peace so so now we see so some sort of asian identity in the way i brought from the geographical uh, understanding and then a kind of a, a the religious the religion played a huge role Uh, and then uh, the language, and and then the food culture, and then the festival. So those are the things that uh, you know we could see uh, the cultural outlook or the cultural phenomena in a way. Uh, we see uh, that that something unique to their uh, the, or the origin of the periphery, but also unique to the Asia uh, as a whole, or maybe even think something more than Asia or beyond Asia. It's also there because that's how the you know Asian identity is not really practiced uh, within Asia, but also globally because of the migration and people live almost every part of the world. So this is more interlinked, but still the Asian identity gives kind of a uniqueness to understand uh, the the diversity uh, among Asian people, right? So that is something. i thought uh, the, i thought at least uh, a good things to discuss in this regard right so now of course uh, we could think about uh, the, uh, okay okay we 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 saw the kind of this identity from uh, the area that i just uh, mentioned but again a, a quick look to 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 make you uh, some sort of the basic understanding what Uh, the piece is really about of course uh, the, the johan kaltung is, is the founder and uh, co-father of, of of peace education so according to him so because why i thought this definition is fit to uh, the identity uh, that has a holistic approach so in a way uh, the the piece is defined from internal and external point of view so for the sake of seeing that okay or the fragility of peace or, or the kind of uh, native uh, the negative aspect of peace that's something okay the absence of direct or the physical violence so that is something you could simply understand and feel i mean even even interpersonal concern okay the person free from interpersonal violence okay or, or decision making or family dispute or one husband and wife and kids and, and with the society or even the nation at large or maybe the region to uh, to a certain extent but the most important part according to johan kaltun to define the 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 level of understanding of uh, the fragile peace is simply uh, the identification of the zero centric of violence so there's no violence so there is something one way of understand so the the positive peace or kind of a kind of a sustainable peace what he is talking about that absolutely both aspect related to the asian identity but the more likely 
The positive piece is something more related to the Asian identity that even you could think something what I said from the religious point of view or cultural or the festival of food and the geographical point of view. So if you look uh, uh, very, very, I mean, very carefully, the overcoming uh, structural and cultural violence in addition to stopping the direct violence. So the sustainable peace, because it entails the presence and the promotion of the social justice. So what he really mean here, kind of overcoming uh, structural and the cultural violence. So these are the things that uh, we have been talking about the cultural dimension of this structural dimension. So in one in the one in which in South Asia, in a way, uh, the Asian society is structured with, uh, as we see, some, some regional division, right? East Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, Central and the, the Middle East or the West Asia. And also the structure that we saw, uh, the, the relationship between the state and the people in a way that the democracy, in a way that uh, monarchy, in a way that uh, semi monarchy, so in a way that uh, one party, the, Kind of what we think, uh, in, even in China, as one party uh, uh, state structure and all the North Korea, it's totally uh, authoritarian or kind of a totalitarian structure. And Russia, of course, if you think Russia is part of the Asia, and again, Russia also kind of semi democratic country, right? So, and then uh, many structural, I mean, many Islamic countries uh, that falling into this category. In a way, it's justified and legitimate based on Islam, right? So there is the Islamic Republic of many countries like Pakistan, Iran, uh, and Saudi Arabia, and most of the Central, Central Asian countries seems like, well, I mean, Southeast, from the Indonesia to well, uh, Indonesia, to Malaysia, and uh, Philippines, uh, still Catholic, but there are uh, uh, Islamic uh, tradition as well. So anyway, so. Uh, those are the structure that you, you could think, okay, the people are divided based on the religious forms and based on the government system and based on the pattern that something, uh, what they feel, okay, as you say, South Asian or East Asian or Southeast Asian, all these differences. And also the cultural violence. So what, in that sense, um, what we technically, that's why I show that, that uh, what is called all this uh, the picture, rather explaining what is culture mean. So that is something, uh, it, uh, yeah, I mean, not really according to what is called the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights and, and followed by the 1967 of uh, social, cultural, political rights of the person and also the civic and political rights of the persons. That is something uh, from the UN point of view in terms of the human rights understanding. But rather we understand from the, that from that point of view, but. Uh, when we think about heritage, culture, and all, that is something far beyond even 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So, it, I mean, the language, religious cars, notions, all that's thousands of years that we uh, evolved. So, in that line of thinking, this cultural violence, in a way, okay, undermine one culture to other culture. Okay, okay, okay. So, that is something we could say. Uh, the societal and the cultural, uh, you know, the violent in a way, the gender disparity, right? Okay, the, because the Asia, anyway, uh, it's, it's, it's a hierarchy, it's a patriarchy. So then the gender difference in a way is quite uh, problematic and complex. Uh, and then the caste, class, especially the Indian and sub South Asian continent, the caste and class, the low caste, high caste, you know, that social classes and, and the social uh, taboo and stigma that that somehow connected to the uh, the cultural differences and then the minority religion minority majority minority division in terms of religion in terms of ethnicity and all kind of a uh, you know, differences in a way fall to or from to more likely a violent conflict or human rights violations or the states. Um, uh, uh, so suppression over the population. So that is, we see even in Korean Peninsula, the South Korea is more or less Western, Western and democracy, where you see the freedom of expression and freedom of education, freedom of assembly and freedom of criticism, all 
or highly celebrate in, in the line of uh, uh, the democracy. But when you come to North Korea, that's something uh, we could think uh, other way around. In a way, everything is controlled by uh, the brutal regime or the authoritarian regime. But in a way, China, if you think, yeah, it has a historical background and, and, and very enriched uh, cultural and, 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 and the language background. But still, in a way that uh, state structure somehow undermine uh, the people will into the democratic participation or freedom of movement and or freedom of expression. So almost everything, especially under this uh, present day uh, information technology, everything is under surveillance. And also there are issues to the, how the majority Chinese or the government, rather the people, treat the minority Muslims that the Xinjiang Khan. So that all become kind of uh, structural and cultural formation of violence uh, that we could think about. So, and even Sri Lanka or India, the caste, class, uh, and, and minority, majority divisions, and gender disparity, and transgenders, LGBT, and all definitely a concern. And more importantly, uh, this is the poverty line, right? The people, most of the people, I mean, as, as you think, the Asia, in a way, the more than 60% of the global population. So out of which, uh, more than half a percentage of the global, I mean, that population are under uh, inequality and the poverty. So then you could see how the structural, the economic differences between poor, rich, and middle, and cultural differences from low caste to high caste of women to on gender perspective, women, men differences, men, female differences, LGBT and all these differences in a way, uh, we could see a, a kind of a, a structural and cultural forms of violence. So this is how um, John Carlton uh, is very precise about this uh, the positive piece that should overcome or should address some of the structure underlying, under, under, underlying problems of the structural cultural uh, sense of violence. So this is something try to you know, create a situation to more likely the promotion of social justice, where uh, the people can be seen uh, from the point of view of social justice and, and a point of view of dignity and point of view of kind of a uh, the fundamental rights, the person she or he or, or somebody he has. But uh, in many cases, uh, that's not the case. So that is something, especially the Asia, because only uh, pretty much Japan and Korea, and then uh, Taiwan and Hong, Hong Kong, but still controversy and uh, still under them, uh, even though they won't climb the independent state, uh, but two of them not really recognized by you and in that point, fully recognized because China is there, because China is always claiming that, that that those countries part of this. So now you see in, in Hong Kong that China recently passed a law, okay, uh, one country, two nations. So China mainland, one nation, the Hong Kong, other nation, but one country, two nations, something like. And the, the case with Taiwan, anyway, Taiwan proclaimed they are like independent state, but do and recognize, but not given a status quo of, as a state. So that's why even, even when we look just 15 minutes before, 48 countries are part of this uh, Asia, but uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong and Mokong, three of them are from China, it seems like a territory and right? not like a country. Anyway, so so from this uh, Johan Carlton point of view, to understand this some sort of the positive piece, uh, something with the structural changes or the cultural changes, or, the, or because of the cultural diversity or the intolerance, so the, the, the violence taking place. So that is his bottom line argument, this positive P in a way to overcome. So of course it may look like a pretty much a kind of utopian concept or maybe more likely idealistic, but in practical term, uh, yes, uh, we could also think uh, like Scandinavian countries where they have proven uh, this social uh, structural changes that empower a person regardless caste, color, class or background. So that is something uh, Scandinavian always uh, are, are more powerful and more, more advanced democracy and also uh, happier states and with, uh, what is called more advanced states and also peaceful states because they consider positive peace into a mainstream uh, democratic uh, pattern. So that is something, uh, right. So I think we got, uh, I think we are right on the break now.
Right, so thanks for your five minutes break. So I just want to quickly discuss about what I just discussed about this, the divining, the defining piece in a way, that's something uh, related to the, the next uh, couple of slides as well. So I think the bottom line of this uh, Johann Carlton definition, so the, the fragile uh, piece, it may look like uh, kind of a, the absence of war, but the, the absence of war or the absence of violence or absence of dispute is, is, is not the 100% guarantee the society or, or the country or, or the region or the continent at large, the Asia, to, to a great extent, are peaceful, right? So that sense, um, uh, there are term, terms that you could see what uh, the Johan Kalt really meant for uh, kind of the native peace in the sense from the, uh, kind of the macro and, and the macro aspect into the absence of violence it can be interpersonal and also uh, communal or uh, the nation or the region at large. And also kind of direct violence in a way that what we think about war or the abuses, the domestic violence and the, the, the women being used as a weapon of war, child ab abuses and all, most of the war is highly targeted to women and children and they become more vulnerable and, and prisoner torture and all these things can be considered as a direct form of violence. So both. The, that's something. So then the, the positive piece is something as you see, the culture uh, and the, the structural formations. So why is this global power, poverty and global hang, hunger? It's, it's a man-made so man uh, structural uh, violence, right? It's not something organ, 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 organically happened in a way that we see. Again, I don't want to go into more detail about uh, explaining what the, 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 the world or the global economy that we have something uh, about the neoliberal economic format that that create uh, the rich become more rich and poor become more rich. But again, even in the Asian context, even though we see most of the country were like the, the in, under influence or uh, the fear of influence of socialism, but now it changed. And even China, it's a communist party. It's, it's a term like communist, but they have changed the economy to capital. So that's why they become number two. And Japan already a capital of the Western. Korea already capital of the Western. The India model also like more towards capital. So in that sense, um, uh, how that the, the poverty and hunger in a way can be as a result of uh, the war and conflict from the structural differences and also the economic policy and the welfare policy or, or the governing system. That's something uh, structural formation like the gender and all. And then the social culture in a way, uh, racism, sexism, the religious intolerance, that is something, okay, we, we are different from them or they are different from us, uh, color, caste, uh, you know, the religious and all these differences. So in a way, even, um, even he, he is very precise about even the ecological factors, that is something, uh, you know, the pollution and the environmental dis discourse and, and that also kind of, you know, the people become vulnerable in that sense. So even Asia, of course, we, we, we got the idea how the, the cl climate change and climate impact and the, and the severe drought and ty typhoon floods and all connected to that nature. So anyway, so if you think that uh, the, the, the positive piece, it, it has so, so much I mean, structural, cultural and ecological aspect in it, right? So that is something I want to give you a sense. So in the same line of thinking that something uh, what does this uh, human security mean? Um, this is something, uh, of course, we are security people and even Asia is it's highly uh, weaponized in that sense, like uh, you say, China, India, and India, Pakistan, North Korea, and so many issues, it's, it's highly weaponized, right? So that sense, uh, the security anyway, uh, fundamentally or traditionally being described uh, based on the state or the security of the state or, or the military security or the national security. So unlike that uh, definition, what kind of uh, shifting aspect of security dimension or security definitions, that's something uh, go, goes to uh, the individual security or equivalent to state. So in that sense, um, the individual person security become important or equivalent to uh, state security, but still uh, state become a prominent uh, character in this regard. Even the Asian aspect, you could see uh, how uh, the state-centric uh, geopolitical and geoeconomic and geo geostrategic aspect being uh, considered in, in a way that uh, the security 
based on security, based on the state. But again, the human security also trying to focus something security for individual, right? So if you think the narrow perspective of the human security, it's something safety from violence. If the person, uh, the human person can be free from some sort of violence of either from direct violence or, or kind of cultural, societal and environmental violence. So what does that mean? So that is something the safety, but the broader perspective of this uh, human security, this is something uh, freedom from a uh, threat of poverty or the structural or the disease, uh, the government policy uh, towards the health, health, health related uh, policies that is some, and the economy and the poor environmental consideration in a way, how the state uh, in a way they become responsible or, or uh, neglect. So in a way, of course, uh, in Asia, even though we see some of the part of Asia, like uh, East Asia pretty much are, are developed in that sense, uh, um, but still the environmental pollution and still there, but unlike uh, the East Asia, but the Southeast and the South Asia become uh, vulnerable to the environmental uh, concern that floods, drought and severe, severe Icons and things like that. But anyway, these are the things like, uh, okay, something. The things. Of course, the poverty, anyway, it's not uh, a natural thing, but it's a man made disaster. like this, the disease. Kind of the structural and kind of environmental consideration. But anyway, uh, Asia in a way, uh, even though we think about or talk about uh, human security that is based on the human centric, but still uh, state become a prominent or state uh, play a significant role in terms of security. So the state, state, but at the same time, how we correlate and how how the each component become like more important when it comes to business security or the security of the states because the security of the state says that is something a bottom line argument underneath. And this is something harmony. So we might think from the philosophical point of view, of course, uh, the harmony uh, is connected to peace and human security, right? In a way that uh, harmony related to peace, uh, a single definition you could read from this and the peace and harmony mean dealing with disputes and resolving conflict fairly and properly with neutralization and, or, or kind of finding the middle way or the middle path principle to further the welfare of each individual, that is something human security in that sense, as well as the well being of the humankind or the mankind in that sense. So, anyway, this uh, the harmony in the way. It seems like. Like a societal and nation wise peace, or too much uh, concern into physical or maybe uh, the issues with uh, uh, the physical environment at that point. But anyway, the, the harmony in a way uh, we could understand in, uh, that is something uh, we could say the dispute resolution or find, uh, kind of finding a middle way or middle path to, to, to balance the self and also the society at large. And the similar argument, even the peace and harmony, I enjoyed and, and processed jointly by humankind, uh, which is uh, based on the fullest uh, realization of the creativity, the potential of individual. So this is something, uh, harmony, of course, it's not something the physical or, or kind of, uh, kind of a only physical or only subject, but it's a kind of a 
combination of subjective and ob objective sense, right? So that is something uh, you could see how the, the peaceful mind or the, that will create more, more critical thinking, uh, creating an alternative or, and trying to realize the total potential of the person in that sense, right? And also, again, towards the development, sustainable development of the country's economy and, and the respective culture and try, be tolerant and uh, trying to accommodate and find strength from diversity and, and try to create unity uh, kind of uh, among self and also among the nations, kind of uh, in a way that the, the so-called harmony creating a kind of a, a, a prosperity of the humankind, right? In the society. So there is, again, this, this line of thinking also connected peace and, and, and human security in that way, because Peace, in a way, uh, uh, positive peace or the negative peace of human rights. Sorry, the human security, which is focusing individual from border and the from narrow and broader perspective, equally to state or the security of the person. So the harmony again, trying to realize uh, kind of the person, and trying to you know uh, realize and get some sort of you know understanding that will help uh, he or she in that sense and also kind of. Uh, creating the well-being of the person uh, that is the potentially uh, individual citizen. So that is the bottom line argument. And, and also that connected to a country or the community or the nations or limited periphery. So in a way, uh, the harmony uh, promote a kind of a whole system among, among different parties and different uh, humankind, and also kind of a creating a whole the, the kind of a holistic view to development uh, and kind of security or, or kind of peace. So this is something uh, you could see from uh, contextual or the subjective and also objective, right? So this is something uh, from Chinese Committee on Relief and Peace, just for the sake of giving. So this is something, okay, we have time until um, uh, 4.20, so roughly we got uh, two, 20 minutes. And let's see how I could discuss something. So these are the major power in Asia, right? So the China, it's number one, that is something uh, more than 14 trillion USD uh, GDP, and also kind of a um, uh, 1.4 billion, right? So it's, it's the majority, um, the number one in the world, even. So then the Japan is, is, is uh, just, but again, China is not a developing country, it's a developing country, but it's a great power. So what do you mean the great power? Is something uh, finding the power within the state and also exercising power out of, sorry, within the state and the region like Asia and also uh, uh, also going other, other really other region as well. I mean, going to Europe and, and, and such as, so kind of China in a way that uh, become like a global power in that sense, but already a great power that totally control Asia from economically, militarily and, 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 and society and even other means, but at the same time, uh, it has proven uh, with the populations, the more diverse in a sense, like the global population, uh, that not only people live in China, but all, almost every part of the uh, planet Earth that Chinese live, and also its economy, right? It's, it's number two, technically. And likewise, the Japan, again, is a great, great power, uh, which has more than uh, 5 trillion USD, the GDP, uh, and also the more powerful. And India, again, is also like a great power in uh, Asia, uh, which has, again, uh, 1.38 uh, billion populations and roughly 2.5 trillion uh, USD in a sense uh, uh, GDP. So anyway, the, out of this, uh, China, Japan, and India are great power, already great power uh, in the region. That means these three powers are, are in a way determined the regional affairs in Asia, and also finding the way uh, other other region as well, the Euro Asia or even Latin America, or Africa, or even the Europe in that sense, and other forms like Korea, the South Korea there, and then the Asian is, is pretty much about the coalition from the Southeast Asian countries. Um, they are also quite uh, significant, and, and they are GDP also in a way. Uh, very strong, uh, but they that they act like a collective. But among the Asian, the Indonesia, Philippines, uh, Singapore, 
uh, Malaysia, they, they, they become uh, the booming economic uh, driven uh, nation states uh, in the Southeast. So there is something Asian is more powerful uh, from economic uh, and the cultural point of view. Because the Asian is very strong in that sense. And Iran, Saudi Arabia, you might say it's, it's the Middle East, but again, it's part of Asia. So they, they are more powerful in the, the West Asia. Russia, again, it's not really a part of Asia, but Eurasia. But if you think Russia, then it's also like a great power uh, that, that uh, dominate Asia or even Europe in that sense. Turkey also like emerging country, like uh, what we see in Iran, Saudi Arabia, or even India uh, uh, in, in, in Asian point of view. But Turkey is not really uh, focused with Asia, but it's more towards the border with Asia and Europe. So it's, they, they work and they are focused more or less Middle East and the Europe rather than the Asia. So anyway, the Asia, you see the, there are already three major powers like India, Japan, China, uh, India, India, Japan, and China, right? So that is something I just want to give you. And then if you move on again, uh, kind of the Asia from the geopolitic, uh, geostrategic and geoeconomic aspect, there are three, I, three slides, same slide I got for you, but in a way that you can see from the geoeconomics or your politics and your strategy, in a way it's interconnected. That's why I, I just uh, give you a kind of holistic view, holistic view to understand. Again, you see the China that's that's controlling the 13 percent of the world economy, right? Almost as, uh, like with, with the COVID, is almost 15 trillion, right? So that is something remarkable. And again, uh, as say Japan is almost uh, five trillion. And uh, India is, is 2.33 trillion, and Korea 1.6 trillion, and Asian as a South Asia, Southeast Asia is, is 3 trillion, and Saudi Arabia, if you own Saudi Arabia, Iran is, is like respectively 7 billion and, and roughly 2 to 200 billion, and then Russia is it's not like a, a, a kind of a very powerful in terms of economy, but why we are calling China, uh, Russia as a great power in terms of uh, its economy, uh, sorry, in terms of its military and, and economy as well. And Turkey is still with uh, less than one uh, billion, uh, sorry, less than one trillion. Anyway, so if you think these countries uh, that that determine the whole, whole Asia uh, architecture, but again, China, you see, become number two in world economy and controlling the 13 to 14, percentage of the global economy and it's almost 15 trillion USD the GDP that's massive and you see China Japan India already a great power uh, in Asia right so that is something I just want to give you a sense uh, what is your understanding and then when we move on to this uh, kind of the geopolitical and again geostrategic and geoeconomic aspect what we really think about this Asia China anyway no one can deny the Chinese ambitions to, to already a great power and, and, and the global power and economically number two after the US. So China, as you say, the 13% of the global economy is controlled by China. So as we believe this Chinese uh, the, the kind of sole, uh, the like ambitious pro project like uh, the Belt and Road, the BRA, that, uh, that trying to connect to more than uh, seven to 100 uh, countries, part of this maritime uh, and land, land root of this uh, trans transportation or, or kind of mutual development or infrastructure development in that sense. It's a massive trillions of dollars uh, uh, project, the ambitious project, um, almost uh, eight years has passed, but still uh, China is, is underway. So that is something uh, everyone, even in the Asian country, uh, everyone is really worried about China's BRA, and some of them become already a partner, uh, except Korea and the Japan and India, but others like Southeast, especially South Asia, Southeast Asia, may, many number of uh, you know countries already become a, a partner in this uh, the Chinese BRA. Anyway, I'm not going to explain much about what is BRA since time is not permit me. But again, uh, kind of a kind of a counter Chinese aspect. Uh, that is something uh, the quad that would uh, you could think about. Uh, that is something, uh, uh, especially the US and Australia, the US basically, anyway, US is always against with China. In a way, Japan and India, 
are part of this squad that that form originally 2007 but become to more active in recent time from 2017 so what i am trying to say here uh, the china anyway is a unilateral uh, the, the power that coming up already regional power but other two regional not the china uh, japan and india <coughs> all that they are aligned with the kind of indo pacific uh, aspect into you know, including oceania so in that sense it's not something they are going further region or beyond asia but also kind of a counter measurement to the chinese uh, aggressive behavior or expansion in uh, in uh, asia so sorry. Um, sorry i'll just give it is okay and um, yeah other thing the asian as you say asian is strength and entity that's purely represent <coughs> sorry south east asia and the regional forum which is focusing on security aspect from human security and from the state security point of view but it is highly focused on the south east asia asia and then the sark there is something south asia but sark is not really function based on the indian uh, dominant and and its neighborhood policy and also issue with pakistan india pakistan so in that sense there are significant uh, focus um, Uh, outcome from the south but uh, not that much as equal to asia or other, otherwise and then the asia pacific economic uh, cooperation that is something china uh, japan are on board uh, because they are already a, a kind of asia pacific member and powerful but not really the asia itself but something from asia and some hey cooperation also kind of uh, the china and russia But if you think Russia also part of this, it's then it's kind of the Asian centric uh, entity, and same like the BRICS uh, kind of the that is something Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. That is something formed in two thousand six. It's something focusing on the global south, but more likely you see the China, India uh, uh, plays a huge role from the Asian Asian point of view. So this is something you could see a kind of a Uh, geopolitical and geostrategic uh, cooperations and coordination and uh, maybe uh, ambitious uh, program uh, in a way that china anyway domain with, with economic and military concern but at the same time uh, there are counter balance uh, like uh, other regional power in asia like china sorry japan and india in a way they, they align with indo pacific regime that let's say and oceania but the other area that you can also see what the purpose right so then the last two slides i have we got like roughly uh, so five minutes the last two slides i just want to give you of course the asia in a way it's it's, it's, a, it's a massive thing and it's, it's, it's a lot of things what we could think about uh, the complexity from the geopolitical and your strategic and your economic point of view but uh, we can see some potential dispute that uh, been uh, occur again and again especially china anyway the china become already a great power and, and more powerful in asia and also want to you know recognize the world superpower and trying to you know accommodate its strength and power by by having kind of legitimate uh, uh, cooperation like vra and but sometimes forcefully doing things uh, cohesion using cohesion and all uh, concern in this regard the south china sea is pretty much about um, southeast asian countries and violating its maritime boundary there is something china claim historically belong to china so there is something we could see that the assertiveness of china and also uh, regional expansionism of uh, of china towards this uh, the project the south china sea issues and then uh, the uh, taiwan that is currently going on the problem the china not recognize the taiwan as an independent or autonomous state and uh, even uh, last week china you know going around and, and there's a kind of cold war between uh, us and uh, china over the taiwan issues and hong kong that is the protection and so many issues that recently china passed forcefully a law that the two nation and one country so there is some something to hong kong is not an independent is part of the china uh, so then um, uh, you see india in a way china has the border issues with india Uh, there is something even some indian thing that there will be a uh, war very soon in the border between india and and, and china especially in the arunachal 
some remote Himalaya. Uh, and also, like Japan, you see this uh, over the uh, Shingato the island, that Japan has a historical dispute with uh, China. So in a way, why I use the US, even though it's not China, it's not uh, Asian, but US in a way trying to get coalitions among uh, kind of anti-Chinese regime in this regard. So how the US, I mean, Quad, that's why I say the Quad, uh, how the India, China, India, Japan going towards the US and then the Asian, uh, regional countries, especially the how U.S. looking into the South China Sea, sea issues and how U.S. support with Taiwan sovereignty and Hong Kong and all definitely a concern, right? This is how and how China, the U.S. defend Japan over its its, its a dispute with Shangato Islands with China and then the Korean Peninsula that is everybody knows the nuclearization of Korea, right? The North and the South that is something you see in day to day life how crazy is about. And then same like India, Pakistan, that is, has been a history since it had been uh, dismantled in a way or separated as, a, as an independent state. So it's not only really just over Kashmir issues, but again, the India-Pakistan border is ideologically and, and with militarily and with, uh, with terrorism and, and cyber and so many accusations that we could see when it comes to India-Pakistan dispute. So that also impact on the cooperation of SARC. And then, if you think Iran and Saudi also part of Asia, so then the Sunni Shia issues, that's something going on in the Middle East. And of course, in the Middle East, the Iran and Saudi Arabia are the more, more significant and more powerful and major uh, great, uh, not great power, uh, regional power, that uh, Iran is Shia oriented and Saudi Sunni. So that is the coalition or, or the dispute that is something still play, it, 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 it's still a key, key concern and, and the violent, escalation and kind of a regional tension or kind of uh, issues to peace and uh, harmony. And then Israel, Palestine, and again, the Middle East, uh, that's you know, more than 50 years of conflict that taken place. And um, um, still, same like, the, I mean, there are a lot of uh, concern that two, two, two state solution is the solution. Okay, Israel is Palestine, it's two different states, but from the Israeli position, it's only one state and one nation. So if Palestine want to leave it to uh, Israel, so they can go and live. There are already people living, Palestinian living under Israeli judiciary. So in that regard, anyway, so that is the conflict everybody knows. Uh, so then what's the harmony that we could create from the geo, geo harmony and peace from the geostrategic point of view that Asia, of course the nuclear, in a way, uh, you see nuclear warfare, how China is already a nuclear country, India is already a nuclear country, and North Korea already nuclear, and, and the Pakistan already nuclear, and Israel already nuclear, and, and the Japan is worried. Of course, Japan and Korea are not nuclear, but they get the support from the US. In that sense, the nuclear in a way maintain peace, right? <laughs> so everybody knows the dangers of nuclear. So even though those countries are highly enriched, with nuclear bomb and with nuclear warfare and using nuclear as a strategy or kind of uh, as a kind of a uh, tool for peace, but still uh, we could see that peace and harmony in a way uh, is taking place because of the nuclear strategical position and the cooperation. So it can be bilateral economy and other, other thing and multilateral like through cooperation, ASEAN or Shanghai or SHARC or, and, and, and DRA. Those are the multilateral and quad, especially Japan and uh, India with uh, Oceania and the U USA. And those are the pretty much multilateral against China or with China. Uh, and also bi bilateral between countries like even Sri Lanka with India, Sri Lanka with China, Sri Lanka with Japan, and likewise the bilateral. That's something, uh, a, a peaceful thing and more. And then people to people relations. So that is most important part that we have to look into. The tourism, how people go and enjoy Asia, right? Crossing border and some, um, I think Asian, the people can travel without any, 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 uh, any visa. So that is something within South Asia, Southeast Asia, people can travel. So likewise, East Asia, uh, uh, Japan and Korea, of course, they are already developed country and they can travel each other without, uh, without visa, but China, they need to get the visa. And everybody needs to get visa to India. That is the Indian policy, but anyway, there's a concern uh, to further strengthen the South Asia by, by leaving uh, no visa or, or kind of visa free 
for South Asia, but that's also kind of under consideration. But anyway, that, that tourism create a kind of a, uh, understanding and also education, the scholarship exchange and students exchange. That is how people go and meet each other and hungry and intellect, uh, academically engaged and intellectual exchange and publications and all. And sports in a way, definitely. Uh, I mean, not only just cricket in the South Asia and even even other sport like Olympics and athletics and how the Asia that uh, sign in the Olympic and, and, and when it comes to specific regional sports like cricket and other things, hockey and all, that also connect people and, and, and support one another and IPLs and all, that is something people uh, you know, from other countries also join as a collective members or the team, so they play for the sport. So the sports create, creates more peace and harmony in that sense, right? Of course, the India-Pakistan cricket, anyway, it, it, it's under fury, uh, fury city, but still uh, sports uh, gives a lot of opportunity. And business, people to people, uh, right? People travel and business and internal business and, and all. not really state to state business, but like more likely people-centric business and immigration and people go and settle down moving and, and all these things. But uh, in Asia, it's not really, I mean, it's, it's not that good. Up. Of course, people only want to go either Korea or Japan because both are developed, but not really to other countries. Uh, but um, yeah, there are uh, people going for asylum seeking and, and, and kind of as a refugee or ID, refugee. In that case, okay, okay, we can see the people to people relationship is concerned. And the sharing cultural and other things, that is something I already shared okay, how we share the culture, heritage, religion, ethnicity, language, and maritime, because it can be a sub-regional or even extra periphery, that Asian identity, because the culture uh, and what I saw is pretty much similar, even though there are significant uh, differences, but pretty much it's different. It's, I mean, it's close to them, close to, to Asia in that sense. And how the maritime, of course, uh, we do share and, and respect the maritime, even though some dispute, but in a way like South China Sea or Indo Lanka maritime dispute, the people come to catch the fish illegally. So that is some sort of dispute, but relatively we maintain a good, I mean, good uh, maritime uh, demarcation in that sense. And what are the issues so that uh, we can uh, regionally work? Like, of course, the uh, um, region, I mean, the issues with poverty, especially the Asia, uh, more prone to poverty and South Asia. And terrorism, especially the South Asia that we know, and transnational crime, the human trafficking, tra trafficking, and illegal fishing, and so much transnational activities that regionally take. I mean, South Asia, I mean, South Asia or East Asia, Middle East, or Southeast Asia, or the Central Asia. So that is something we could specifically look into. And more likely, the global issues also connected. In a way, I mean, uh, climate change and global warming. I think everybody become more vigilant and work collectively despite in individually and pandemic, global pandemic is it's a global phenomenon, but again, Asia, how the Chinese vaccine being uh, distributed to other country and Indian vaccine diplomacy and all, definitely a concern into this collectiveness of the Asia. So these are the things that of course bring uh, peace and harmony uh, from, from, from uh, kind of a geopolitical and geostrategic and geoeconomic aspect. So with that end, I think we got roughly five minutes, so I may ask for a question and answer, and thank you very much. Sir, you talk about partners of China and uh, you know non-Chinese parties. Would you consider us a partner of China? <laughs> okay, I mean that's I mean the most uh, one thing also kind of a connected to South Asia uh, uh, non-alliance policy. So that is something South Asia and even Southeast Asia in a way that we, we are not aligned with what any any major power. So that's why we are regionally aligned, like South Asia, SARC, or ASEAN, and something like. But again, uh, because that was uh, reflected, the Cold War legacy between USA and USSR, that, that is something almost uh, four, 40 years of time. But now, of course, um, uh, with Sri Lanka, I still have the non-aligned, and most of the Southeast Asia and South Asia, and most of the Asian countries are like one alliance country. In that sense, um, of course, they are not really aligned with one to others, but for, for the reason of cooperation, they can become a member or in a way aligned. So that quad, that's something uh, Japan, uh, India, Australia, US allied, got allied in a way to counter the Chinese BRA. So in that sense, uh, country like Sri Lanka, of course, we have uh, immediate uh, 
immediate country, powerful hegemony with India. So that is something part of the South Asia. And then we have Pakistan and Bangladesh in a way part of the what is called South Asian periphery. And then the extra periphery that is East Asia, that is Japan and China. So in that sense, uh, China, of course, we see uh, a potential investor in, in Sri Lanka, Hamandota and, and Fort City and airport highways and, and, and even uh, vaccine diplomacy and so many things. In that sense, of course, our foreign policy not change into aligned with anything. But what we see, we similarly manage India, China, India, Pakistan, India, India, China, India, Pakistan, and China, USA in a diplomatic manner. So that is something still we are continuing. So that's why we see Sri Lanka, we give some, some, some properties and some, uh, free, uh, some sort of alliance with China in a way that uh, Hamandota and Fort City project and in a way with India that recently the Trincomalee oil refinery and, and, and other, other means, even the East Terminal, not sure, but some highway project to China and uh, Japan uh, in a way. So then I would say uh, we are not aligned like NATO alliance or Asian kind of things, but uh, we are not either uh, to West or the East, or West means USA and East means China. But again, the new changes, uh, again, the US uh, policy towards Asia, one, one is a quart and the other one is uh, the recent um, uh, AUKUS uh, submarine deal between Australia, France, and the UK, that also kind of counter China. And then uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, again, that's a massive, uh, uh, partnership uh, by the the whole world, especially Pacific and Indo-Pacific, that's pretty much against China. So in that line, of course, the Western alliance also very become very powerful to curtle the Chinese uh, uh, the global power ambition. But at the same time, uh, South Asia. I mean, being in, being in South Asia, we have issues with India, and also we have uh, concern with um, China and the USA. So anyway, we balance. <laughs> I can't say. Uh, but again, we also see it's also depend on the, our political party, whoever in power. Present party seems like uh, more towards China in that sense. Uh, and last time, last uh, then government is more towards uh, Western. So that is how we see in Sri Lankan politics and two mainstream parties, UNB and SLAP in a way, uh, like East and West. But still we maintain the non-aligned movements and we are not towards uh, any, any alliance. <laughs> That also a bit of a kind of a balancing the situation. Otherwise, but also there are strong um, opposition also. I mean, if we ally with either China or either USA, then we, we will be more, more prosperous and more peaceful. What we see India, I mean, India in a way uh, become a member with uh, so many anti-Western, uh, anti-Chinese uh, multilateral or what and, and the trans Pacific partnership and things like that. So I believe I, I made some point to address your question. <laughs> uh, firstly, I would like to say I'm truly sorry for not being able to visually present myself, uh, but I would like to say a very good evening to all ladies, gentlemen, and friends. Uh, it's my pleasure to deliver the word of thanks actually on behalf of the students of this short course. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank our lecturer, Mr. Satish Mohant. I'm very sorry if I got the name wrong, sir, uh, but we thank you very much for sharing your time and knowledge with us and for um, delivering this important lecture amidst, amidst your surely busy schedule. Um, so your address was set the tone for this course by clearly indicating the role of peace and harmony in our region, in our Asian region. Uh, we are blessed to definitely have you contribute to this course. Nextly, I would like to thank Dr. Hemanth Premaratna and all other KDU staff for making this event possible and getting all the getting all the lectures together. Thank you very much. Last but not least, I would like to thank all of you who have come for participation today, and uh, definitely you have uh, made this event a success. And I believe it has definitely provided you with an insight into the Asian identity towards peace and harmony. So to conclude, let me once more express my gratitude to Mr. Satis Mohanad. I'm sorry, sir. <laughs> yes, sir, Mohandas. Uh, sorry about that. 
Uh, but thank you very much, sir, again, for delivering today's lecture. And uh, it is an honor to have you with us. And your time and efforts are deeply appreciated. Thank you very much, everyone. And so, have a good so thank you. And also, I will share this presentation with Dr. Heyman, there, where you can also get. All right, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Share. Nice. Have a good day and the rest of the week. Have a good day. Yes.